All right, good afternoon, and uh, thanks for coming out to see our talk. Uh, there's a great presentation across the way, so I'm glad you guys uh, were interested in learning about, uh, <laughs> thanks, uh, what we have to say. So basically, uh, we're going to talk about tool smithing. Uh, using a case study is uh, NIDA Bridge, and we're also going to throw in some other things that we've done uh, previously. Uh, first off, my name is Adam Pridgen, and this is Matthew Wollenweber. And uh, as a, a brief introduction to what the presentation is going to cover, we're going to give an introduction to what we're actually going to talk about, uh, you know, a little bit of background about tool smithing and such, uh, then discuss what tool smithing is and the development process that we kind of use. And then we'll talk about some of the cases and shortcuts that we actually apply these techniques our, apply our techniques to, so that way you can see in, in real life how you could actually learn from this type of stuff. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about uh, RE Bridge. It's basically an evolutionary uh, project that just came out of a really random idea I was given to by a friend and I had experienced previously. And so it's just kind of evolved from you know one thing into something grand and spectacular. But it's tedious to do software and development, so we use tool smithing and, and try to do rapid prototyping to help speed up the development process. And then we'll follow that up with some lessons learned from uh, uh, the various techniques and various processes that we've used. And then we'll talk uh, conclusions and uh, give special thanks. So just a brief background or introduction to me. Uh, I've been in information security for about seven years. Uh, before that, I was in the military. Uh, so I've always been really entrenched in attacker, defender type of uh, mentality. Uh, so I got involved in security when I was at the University of Texas. So I've been a, f a student. I've taught adjunct faculty in an adjunct faculty position before. I'm pen tester, reverser, and I love to write code. Um, currently, I'm working at Praetorian, and my personal site is the cover of night.com, hence the green and black background. And this is Matt. Hi, uh, my name is Matt Walnober. I'm the incident team lead at the George Washington University. Uh, primarily, we focus on monitoring the network. Uh, it's fairly high throughput. We have two uh, slash 16s. Also, handle up all the reversing, the binary analysis type stuff. I used to be a consultant, worked for the government, was a contractor, a pen tester. Uh, basically decided that the only place that put up with me was a university. So now I'm staff there and hopefully I'll be a PhD student before too long. Uh, so a little bit of introduction to what we're actually doing here. It's a talk about tool smithing, it's a talk about Ida Ridge, um, but basically it all derives from one thing. We're sort of lazy, but we're OCD about getting things done. Uh, so we want to make sure that we surpass the expectations we have on projects, uh, but we want to work smarter, not harder. So if we get a chance to write some code, we want to do that. So basically, you know, the, a lot of this talk is tips and techniques to how to get that done while still doing short-term projects that a lot of people are going to be familiar with. Um, and a lot of it's experience-based. Uh, so this is called tool smithing. It's based off of you know a lot of software development techniques in the past. Uh, it's something that. Adam and I both do naturally and that he really picked up for this talk. Uh, it's intended to make the development process easier, faster, streamline it from you know, not being a big software development project, but small tools meant to help get things done. Generally, these aren't standalone applications. They're additions or uh, add-ons to other programs that help you meet particular needs that you have for your project or whatever software you need to do. So it's not reinventing the wheel every time. It's adding on incrementally just to get stuff done. So really what we want to talk about are rapid prototyping, especially in, in time box windows. So when we talk about tool smithing, we're talking about prototyping capabilities. We're talking about saying, I'm on a time box uh, pen test, and I need a tool that does X and Y, and I need to you know, model and conceptualize what I'm trying to accomplish. And then from that model and conceptual conceptualization, I'm trying to implement something so that I can get something useful out of it. The, the point being is you don't want to spend uh, 16 hours when you have only a week to, to complete an engagement. The idea is to, to finish your, your script or your tool in a matter of like four to five hours and get it to a point where it's working and then you can actually apply it to something. The whole idea is to build something that's loose and open and then you, know, you can go back and improve it or release it or do whatever you want. But you know, the primary goal is always to make, make everything you do into a, a specific functional task. Uh, so the way we look at this is sort of an evolutionary type thing. So you have your particular project requirements that you're doing. You know, if you're a pen tester, you're on the gig for what, a week, maybe two. If it's malware reversing, you might have a bit longer. Uh, so from that, you go into quick hacks that just make your life easier. After a while, though, you might be like, hey, this was a really good idea. We should make this something more. You sort of evolve into a proof of concept code. You know, this is something that is more than just a quick hack, but it's just, you know, hey, this bigger idea might actually work. 
Uh, from there, you move into you know a bigger prototype. This is something that your, is your full idea. It's sort of where Ida Bridge slash RE Bridge is now. It's it, it's there. It's working. It's bigger than something you do on a project. A lot of time's been put into it, but it's definitely not something that you'd think of as you know pushed out there software. And from there, you evolve your tools and techniques. So you have this big thing that you have now, um, and you should make your process better. You know, take in your tools to be able to deliver better services for whatever your next project is. So rapid prototyping. We've already, we've already uh, emphasized this before. You need to meet an objective. You need to do it really quickly. It's often short-lived. It's time box development. So the idea is to d find a task that's going to only take you a couple hours or you know, maybe even a day, and use that as one of your primary milestones. And so what you do from there is you try to identify as many shortcuts as you can possibly as you can possibly take, which means you know taking in open source software, uh, looking for documentation, and stuff along that lines. So we're going to backpedal a little bit and talk a little bit about how we work in in this this type of environment. So first of all, in general, we work in ad hoc groups. Like uh, it's not like someone comes in and says, I need a tool that is going to, you know, get me root uh, by, you know, or get me uh, passwords out of the registry because somebody saved their WinSCP key. It doesn't happen like that. It's very ad hoc. It's, it's very fluid. So generally what happens is you'll find an objective that you need to meet. Uh, you'll be like, hey, man, I don't know how to do this. Do you have any idea? You start bouncing ideas off, off of each other. You'll write code together. And then you'll just glue the code together and make it work. Now, another, another you know, drawback to this is putting these pieces together gets, a little, gets to be a little bit tedious as you're rewriting code or updating code or merging code. It, it's, it's all super frustrating. An, a bigger uh, element of this is when you start looking at more complex ideas or more complex ar architectures, say like a distributed system. Distributed systems aren't something that people encounter on, an, on a day-to-day -day basis. So if you start looking at, okay, I want to make tool X and tool Y talk to each other, how do I do that? You know, I need to do it so that it's it's atomic, so that you know any changes made don't uh, trump over you know changes made by a previous iteration. You need to make it so that uh, the communication makes sense between the two. So you got to kind of take up what you're trying to do and build a prototype so you can understand you know how the two are going to actually interact. So this kind of goes back to, to Fred Brooks from the Mythical Man Month, where you just prototype, so you build one to throw it away. So we tend to lead towards a more iterative process. So you know, we write a basic tool. We get an idea of like what went wrong, what went right. We take it and we iterate, and we we create a new uh, a new tool based off of, or we create a new iteration, add more functionality or features based off of that. Um, the idea is just to model it once or twice, get a get a good understanding or a grasp of what's going to happen. And then start working on what might be a final product. The idea is you're never going to come up with a perfect solution the first time. And the more time you spend thinking about what you're going to do, you're just going to burn yourself out, wasting time trying to figure out what's, what's the right way to, to do things. Um, so generally, the third implementation is considered to be the best. Uh, in the case of IdaBridge, it took me three times to actually get a working command line interface to, that would interact with not only IdaBridge, but also interact with you know, any other tools that we would want to connect up to it. So all that being said, most of this development depends on the project. Uh, you know, that being said, there's a lot of common challenges. OK. Um, so one of the first things you need to do when you're specking these projects is identify exactly what needs to happen. So uh, I don't think people tend to have these immediate great ideas that just come to them. I think that more often it's a problem that you face from a particular gig, from a particular challenge. Uh, so you need to identify what you need to do. Uh, from there, you need to make your milestones. Uh, this seems a little bit formal for you know project development type stuff, but if you're working alone or you're, you're on a project, maybe you've decided, hey, I could do this thing manually, or I could write some code for it. You got to sort of set your guidelines of if I can't actually get my code to work, you know, when do I need to call stop and you know push this off to something later? So milestones are, are key for that reason. Additionally, if you're you know this is a personal project that's going to take some more time, you need to be able to set these milestones so that you know you're getting there and so that you can work with people and so that it doesn't just fall away as you have more needs to come up. Um, don't try to write more code. Lots of people are like oh I, I've hacked out this many lines of code, this many things. Uh, just focus on getting things uh, done. Uh, to do this, you're going to use different libraries, different code bases. You're going to be reading through documentation. Basically, don't reinvent the wheel every time. Um, and so. We also have debugging and interact interaction. So 
when you write code for the very first time, you don't really know if it's going to work. You have this general concept, you know, you compile and run it, and it's like, uh, there's a bug, you know, pointer bug, or you know, maybe you didn't initialize something. So having a good environment and interacting with the, the data and the functions that you're actually putting into the the, pro the development process is actually one of those key things that people should really look at and evaluate as they're doing things. So, you know, going back to what we've just said, there are some ways to address some of these challenges. So, for instance, open source is a great source for figuring out how to do certain things, figuring out uh, how to perhaps make a make a make a client talk to a, a server. So you instead of going back and rewriting the entire protocol, you just go and repurpose some code from another person's project. Um, that being said, you can go through and review the code and figure out what is usable and what is not, and then just strip out what you need and get rid of the rest. So in that case, you know, the, the existing code base is always fantastic. And this really, really helps out when you're starting to think about developing complex components and, and complex projects. Uh, for instance, if you want to build a DNS mapping tool, you don't go through and implement the entire DNS protocol. It, it's quite tedious. So what you do is you go download Bind's implementation, you strip out their stuff, and you just take their protocol and you in, implement that into your project. Same thing with uh, building a, something like a fuzzer. Um, so here are some of the tools of the trade. Uh, in general, we try to use Python, but we, we, we want to say that using high-level languages abstracts a lot of the complexities away from what you're trying to do. You know, dealing with pointer arithmetic, dealing with complex structures. A lot of this stuff can be modeled very quickly in Python, or Ruby if that's, that's your particular flavor. And that being said, I've, I've talked about using de debugging arguments or debugging environments to help with you know, data interaction or rapid prototyping to enable you to change the functions and, and you know, build quickly or make sure everything works quickly. Uh, IPython or IRB are perfect environments for this. IPython I use on a regular basis. IDEs and debuggers are also a good source if you're working in a, a structured uh, development project. Uh, some other stuff, some other things that I, I've used in the past and that we've used in the past are network sniffers such as Wireshark and Mallory. And this just gives us an opportunity to, to, to change stuff around, flip bits, uh, figure out if we're really parsing a protocol correctly or uh, making sure that the, the messages that we're forming actually go out correctly. Uh, so some tools of the trade. Uh, one is make sure you look at the API documentation. Sometimes it's a bit tedious. You know, if you're looking to do some assembly or some stuff there, don't read the whole uh, Intel assembly architecture. You know, it's like 15 pounds. But if there's some quick stuff, go to MSDN, figure out you know what to do rather than reversing a whole Microsoft library. You know, just go to the documentation, figure out, use what works. Uh, look for books and papers. This is along the same lines. You know, make things easy for yourself. Find out what works. Don't uh, you know push out resources because you only reverse or you only uh, do things by the API. Uh, and again, build off of uh, other source code that's already existed that already exists. Um, real code usages are, are nice because it shows you oh this actually works. Um, yeah. Experiment. So the big the big thing is the big emphasis is find as many shortcuts as you can. And you know generally this goes back to using open source software, but. You know, ideally what it could come down to is, you know, maybe you just, instead of opting to do something in C, C++ or Java, you just go straight to, to Python or Ruby, and then you find out what you really need to implement in those, those more complex languages. So in this first case, um, what we're going to talk about is how I went through and identified uh, and decrypted WinSCP uh, keys out of a, out of a client's uh, Windows registry. So basically what it came down to is I managed to break into this host on a paid gig, so it wasn't illegal. Um, and I noticed that in, in the registry I found some keys that had password associated with them. When I went back and looked, it actually corresponded to the WinSCP, uh, WinSCP application. So rather than you know, trying to reinvent the wheel, uh, well, first of all, I thought, well, I want to get at that. I know that those passwords have to be re reversible because they're passed on to the client at some point. Um, so it was like, how do I do this? I could do something really complex like attach a debugger, or I could do something really quick like download the source code and review it. So what I did is I downloaded the WinSCP stuff um, and found that there were some pretty nifty APIs that do the encryption and decryption. Now, uh, for anyone that's curious, if you ever install WinSCP, your passwords are actually saved in an encoded format and under sessions. Um, and then, you know, somebody like me can actually come back and steal them and decrypt them and get access to whatever you have. So, 
Um, the way I found it is I basically grew up for encrypt and then I grew